Hello. A decade ago, it would have been preposterous to imagine that the two of us would be standing here before you talking about, of all things, the role that comics could play in transforming healthcare. Yet here we are. For the past five years, MK and I have been working in this intersection between comics and medicine that we refer to as graphic medicine, exploring the role that it can play in changing the healthcare system. And our inquiry has really led us to a number of surprises. And what we'd like to do for you today is share with you some of the surprises that we've encountered. But first, we'd like to talk a little bit about the challenges that each of us individually faced that brought us to find graphic medicine. Now, I'm a physician and a bioethicist. I work at an academic medical center. I see patients, I do research, I do teaching. And in my varied roles, people often approach me with what they say is an ethical concern. And my experience has shown me that when some people come to me and say, you know, I've got an ethical problem I'd like you to think about, it's not really an ethical problem. Oftentimes, it's a problem with communication or it's a problem with not fully understanding the patient's experience of illness. And the toolbox that we use in ethics to deal with ethical problems is not really ideally suited for addressing these concerns. And I'm a nurse and a comic artist. My clinical experience is in HIV AIDS care and in hospice care. And in doing that work, I came to this sort of realization that as healthcare providers, we, especially nurses, bear witness to incredible stories, the kinds of stories that that documentary is talking about. We're there bearing witness to all these hundreds of stories. And those stories are often the source of great satisfaction with our work. They make us feel good about what we do. But when those stories are traumatic and difficult and hard to bear witness to, we hold on to those too. And what do we do with that? What do we do at the end of the day? I have a theory that we sort of stuff all those stories down. We get those images out of our heads. We just sort of stuff it down, thinking like, it'll go away, it'll go. Because that's what we need to do. We need to be present to the patient who's lying on a stretcher or sitting in a chair or in a bed in front of us. And that person deserves our, our best self. So I wonder if there isn't a consequence for caregivers of all that stuffing down, of not attending to all of that that can possess us. And I've, as thinking as a nurse and a medical humanist, I've come up with this term, narrative constipation. And that's all these stories we've stuffed down. So for different reasons, by different paths, we've come to the realization that the needs of patients aren't adequately being met by the way we do things currently, and that having a better sense of patient stories can really be part of the answer. And to our delight and surprise, we found that comics could actually be helpful. Now, I came to this conclusion and this realization uh, a number of years ago when I came across this book. It's called Mouse by Art Spiegelman, and it's a Pulitzer Prize-winning graphic memoir of the, uh, the author's parents' experience in Nazi death camps during World War II. They were interred in, in Auschwitz. And I read this book, and I was just blown away. I couldn't believe that such an important, serious topic could be dealt with so effectively using this comics medium that just puts together words and images. I had previously associated comics with frivolous kinds of things, like Sunday funnies or maybe superheroes, but not something serious like the Holocaust. And so I read this and I started to think, I wonder if there's other examples of memoirs out there uh, that address illness type kinds of stories, because I do a lot of teaching of medical students and others uh, in a department of humanities and internal medicine about, uh, about patient stories. And so I started looking around, and it turns out there's quite a few of these graphic memoirs dealing with illness. And these stories can be actually quite helpful. So I put together a course, the first course of any kind uh, in the world, as far as I know, on comics and medicine for medical students. And I continue to teach with this today. And I came to this work through this book, Mom's Cancer, by Brian Fees. I was in the Museum of Contemporary Art um, gift shop in Chicago on the second floor, which was mostly a book and video shop. And I saw that cover propped up on a table across the room. And I thought, is that a central line dressing, ca catheter dressing on the neck of a woman on the front of a book? And that idea just blew me away. That was an image that was very familiar to me in my professional life, but certainly one I'd never seen this publicly displayed, certainly one I'd never seen on the cover of a book, let alone 
a graphic narrative, a comic book. And to sort of give you, get you into the, kind of the kinds of stories that can be shared this way, we'd like to share a passage from this book, Mom's Cancer. And we're going to read through this together. This section's called The Usual Unusual. At every visit, the doctors always say, call immediately if you notice some, anything unusual. This simple order turns out to be surprisingly hard to follow. This is mom, the patient. I have a headache. And the healthcare provider on the other end of the line says, yeah, don't worry about it. Oh, okay. I had a deep cough. What? You should have called at once. Oh. I feel weird stingers in my head. That's normal with a brain tumor. Oh, okay. I had a leg cramp. That could have been a deadly blood clot. Why didn't you call? Sorry. I can't breathe. So you have lung cancer. What did you expect? Right. She's wrong when she complains, and she's wrong when she doesn't. Either way, she feels stupid. How am I supposed to know? After a while, she stops trying. What I think Brian does here is addresses some of the things that Michael raised in terms of communication. What Brian can do as a family member who stood back and watched this happen was show us as healthcare providers the position we've put our patient into. Now another graphic memoir I'd like to share with you today is this one called Cancer Vixen by Marissa Marchetto. And it's a story about what happens when a single glamorous woman living in New York City without health insurance discovers that she has breast cancer. And the scene I want to show you starts with Marissa doing what she does, drawing at her table when the phone rings. And she stands up to answer the phone and finds out it's Dr. Mills calling. And the next panel is rather remarkable for depicting what it feels like to receive bad news. The doctor says nine words, Marissa, this is Dr. Mills, there's an abnormality. And you see Marissa, her hands cover her eyes, her mouth is agape with horror, her hair stands on end, and she recalls the exact moment of the phone call, 10, 12 a.m., exactly. My world came to an end. And what this comic shows is what very well may have been a mundane, typical, routine phone call from the point of view of the doctor is life-altering from the point of view of a patient. Marissa remember, remembers the exact moment of the phone call, just like 9-11 or the time JFK was shot. Here's another scene from the same book uh, when the doctor is trying to describe the upcoming core biopsy. And it's one of the best examples that I've seen anywhere that depicts the complexity of having an informed conversation and promoting informed consent in the context of a serious illness. So the doctor is doing what doctors do. He's probably going through a routine conversation, explaining what is the nature of the procedure, what are the risks, and what are the benefits, and what are the alternatives. And he's doing what it's supposed to do in terms of disclosing information. But what you see is Marissa and her mother with a, with a neck brace on, uh, they clearly don't understand very much at all of what he's saying. They retain a few words. And the insight that Marissa has that next time she's going to bring a tape recorder so that she could replay the information at a time later when she's maybe not so anxious and she's able to retain the information. It's a remarkable uh, panel because it communicates so much information about the complexity of informed consent, and yet it does it in an economic and efficient way. This entire panel is only two inches by two inches in size. Here's another example from Cancer Vixen, which shows what it's like to live with cancer. And while people may be having a routine kind of conversation that seems like life is normal, cancer's always in the background lurking, like an elephant in the room. And there's nothing routine about it. And what's particularly interesting to me about this is the way the artist uses graphic elements in this picture. In, the, in this case, the words cancer, 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 which actually, the words themselves evoke what cancer cells are like in real life. They're uncontrollable, they're irregular, they're, they're, um, they know no boundaries. And uh, she does this with the drawings as well as the words. Well, as John said, comics, as you can see just from these few quick examples, are tremendous windows into the experiences of living, the lived embodied experiences of illness. Um, 
Another example I want to share with you today is from a book called Tangles by Sarah Levitt. And we're going to read through this one together as well. Um, Sarah is telling us the story of her mother who has early onset Alzheimer's. And that's Sarah there, and she's visiting her mom who's taking a bath. Mom, can I come in? Of course. Hi, Mom. Hello, sweetie. Having a nice bath? Oh, yes. Mom's clothes were piled on the floor. There was dried shit in her underwear. The bath water was full of small disintegrating bits of it. She was dipping her washcloth in the water and rubbing it all over her skin. She had no sense of smell, true, but she could see. She just could not recognize. She couldn't recognize shit, dirt, shame, disintegration. There are moments when you have a choice, fall apart or take a deep breath and just do what needs to be done. Drain the tub, spray the water hard so everything goes down, rinse, wash, rinse, take her hand, let her dry herself, help her with her nighty, tuck her into a warm, dry bed, turn out the light, stand in the hallway outside her door, feel a new loneliness and a new strength. One of the reasons I really enjoy this passage uh, from this book is that that's not a story I don't think we're going to hear in a clinic visit, or we're not going to hear that story walking into a, a, a hospital room in a very short time. That's a story that we very uniquely as healthcare providers can see, again, the lived experience of illness. One of Sarah's goals with this book, Tangles, was to show us the more taboo sides of illness and caregiving. Um, and I think comics are a medium that grew up in some ways showing us some taboo things that we didn't usually talk about. Um, and so I think she cho chose a great medium for her goal with this book. Now another example of a comic which addresses a taboo topic is this one called Monsters by Ken Dahl. And in this case it's the story of a gentleman who thinks he has a herpes infection of his lip. And when Ken is diagnosed with herpes, He's, in his own mind, transformed into a horrible monster, someone who's unlovable, disgusting, uh, and, and transformative. So, uh, and, and he depicts this transformation uh, in a series of grotesque drawings that he makes uh, that you can see here. Now, not only are comics effective for depicting, depicting physical illness, but they're also quite effective for depicting what it's like to live with mental illness. And this story, Marbles, by Ellen Forney, does a wonderful job of demonstrating what it feels like to have bipolar illness or manic depression. So here she shows what it's like to be manic, the flight of ideas, the rapid speech, the uncontrollable uh, um, thoughts and so on. And later she shows what it feels like to be depressed. And Ellen uses this wonderful visual metaphor of a carousel to show what it's like to have the ups and downs that are characteristic of manic depression. Something that can't be done quite so effectively using other mediums. The graphic novels that we've shown you are predominantly um, graphic memoir. So the person creating it is someone living with the illness or a family member or a caregiver. Um, and there's a vast body of these works already out there. Here are a few more samples. Um, they cover a wide range of body systems and diagnoses. I think you'd really be surprised um, how wide a range of, of illnesses are covered by these graph kinds of graphic novels. And there's a website called graphicmedicine.org that was set up by a doctor in the UK who was doing a thesis in medical humanities and wanted to kind of take a look at this. Uh, it was through that website that Michael and I met. We've since redesigned that website to be helpful to healthcare providers and people working in healthcare so that they can take a clinical interest area, say organ transplant, put that in as a keyword search and get the resources that are available in comics and graphic text, patient education comics, kind of what's available. Uh, and we are constantly re building that website from the, the back and trying to gather information to be a resource for comics and medicine. 
the physician who set up that website initially, I mentioned, his name is Ian Williams. He's a doctor and also a comic artist. And he did this illustration for an article in the Journal of Medical Humanities. And I really like it because I think it captures what can happen. Um, the comic creator and the comic reader, through the work, can form an empathic bond. And if you think about the kinds of comics we've been showing you, that can really be very productive in, this, in healthcare. And not only are comics great for demonstrating the patient's experience of illness, we've also found in our work that making comics can have a useful role to play in medicine. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a comic artist in addition to being a nurse. And I didn't start out intending ever to be a comic artist. Um, I found myself making my first comic one morning after, um, during the AIDS crisis, working on a dedicated AIDS unit in the um, mid, early, and, and throughout the 90s, actually. And um, a beloved patient had died. And I sat before a white piece of paper, trying to get myself ready to go to work that next day and kind of put that deal with my own stuff. And I was sitting before this blank piece of paper and not knowing what else to do, words alone failing me, images alone failing me, I just drew this picture of myself feeling miserable. And then I just wrote what, how I felt. And then for some reason, because there was this image in this text and they felt like they needed to be pulled together, I put a box around it. And this sounds unlikely, but it really truly is how 13 years ago I started making comics. And then because there was one box there, I put another box. And I thought about um, cartoonists who had tackled some serious things, and I thought, OK. What I didn't know at that time was that the empty space between two boxes is referred to as the gutter space in a comic. And there's, believe it or not, a lot of theory out there about what happens in the gutter space. I don't know very much about that. What I do know is that for me, the empty space between two boxes in a comic asks a question, and then what? So I started with this state. And I had to ask myself, OK, and then what? which made me have to keep moving. And this comic went on for nine panels. And rather than share with you all this comic, because it's not really what's important here, I'd like to take it to the abstract and show you what happened. So I had my nine panels in the end. I started, as I said, in a place of despair and confusion and feeling overwhelmed by all these emotions. And I just kept asking that question, doing a little bit of drawing and a little bit of writing in between, kind of accessing, you know, all kinds of areas of my brain at the service of this issue. And I found myself, this was a big surprise, in a very different place by the end. I found myself in a place of hope and a place of clarity. That worked that one day, and it continued to work for me the entire time. I continued working as a nurse in AIDS care and in hospice care and in personal caregiving. And I continue to make comics to this day because I believe, for all the reasons I just shared, it makes me a better caregiver. Now, as I mentioned, I teach a course to fourth year medical students on comics and medicine. And one of the things I have the students do in addition to reading comics is I have them tell their own stories in a graphic format. And like MK, medical students by the time of their fourth year medical school have accumulated many experiences and stories. But medical school doesn't really provide much of an outlet for them to process these stories or to creatively express themselves. And so I have them draw comics. I'm going to share some excerpts from one. Uh, called The Taming, Taming of Tina. This is written by Taylor Olmsted, who is now a pediatric resident. And this tells the story of what it was like to take care of a belligerent young girl who uh, frightened everybody. Uh, so here's Tina. She comes to the hospital, and the healthcare providers are freaking out because they find out that she's going to be admitted. And they do their best to make nice to her, but it doesn't work. One of the nurses says, there's no way I'm taking care of that girl. And then enter. Taylor. And what's interesting about this is she shows her transformation and maturity through the course of taking care of Tina. First, she depicts herself as a superhero. She's going to save the day. Then she's the eager beaver. She wants to please the attending physician and do whatever it takes. Then she becomes the super sleuth. She's going to be a detective who gets to the bottom of the mystery of Tina. And over time, she matures. And she comes to the realization that the reason Tina's ornery is because she has a painful rash on her hip. And nobody had uh, discovered this before. And so the story shows how Taylor becomes an empathic healer. She surprises the nurses when she gives Tina a hug goodbye when Tina's being discharged. And she gives a reassuring pat on the shoulder. And we realize that Taylor's going to be a great doctor in the end. And this comic does a great job of showing the transformative power of comics and also for showing 
complex emotions, which are often very difficult to demonstrate. Now, after teaching this course for a couple of years, I decided it was really time for me to walk the walk in addition to talk the talk. And so I thought, you know, I really have to make my own comic. And so I worked with a very talented artist named uh, Ray Reek to create a comic of my own experience uh, when I was an intern in training 20-something uh, years ago in internal medicine. And this was published last March in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And I'm not going to read it for you, but it's called Missed It. And it tells the story of a devastating mistake that I made as an intern, which led to a patient's death and some of the emotional aftermath uh, for me of, the, of this experience. And this was published uh, in March. And since that time, there's really, I was really taken aback by the outpouring of support that I've received uh, from people who read this, who were not only relating to the story and the experience, but also were very supportive of the medium, using comics as a way of telling the story. And I've since learned that uh, this comic has been used for teaching in medical schools across the country on a range of topics. Uh, including patient errors, medical diagnosis, even cognitive bias and decision making. It's been really quite gratifying. The last surprise we want to share with you about the work at the intersection of comics and medicine is that Michael and I are not alone. Uh, a few years ago, the first international conference on graphic medicine was held. And since then, we've gathered a great community of people who are all working in this area, each person thinking they were the only person in the world doing this. What we're seeing in the, in the comics and medicine community is a world where people are combining their personal passion with their professional work. And in that, recognizing that we are all, at some point in our lives, patients, and we are all creative beings. Well, so in closing, I want to say that we encourage you to explore the intersection between comics and medicine. Go to the bookstore, pick up one of these wonderful graphic novels that we've described, or maybe even pick up a pencil and a piece of paper and draw a box, maybe make a drawing. You might be surprised where it takes you. We know we have been surprised, and you may be too. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you sit down. That was just terrific. I just, um, you know, I find myself sort of mystified about um, why does it work? I mean, I, I actually have always asked that question about comics because I'll be reading a comic and I'll, I'll kind of go, why am I absorbed? I had a very similar experience reading Spiegelman's Mouse and I've, I'm a big fan of Artie's and he's you know, a dear friend and an unbelievable storyteller. But it, it just seems so magical. Why does it work? You want to take it? Yeah, you know, I think every time I think about answering that question, I have a whole other answer. And I think that means that there are a lot of answers. Um, just one I was thinking about today um, is that comics are something that are safe and comforting to us. We read them as children. And so then to approach them with a serious, often traumatic, troubling adult experience, it almost feels like a safe place. Um, and there's something, too, about boxes. I'm a person who's very easily overwhelmed. And so when I go to just work on one box of a comic, I don't have to worry about the whole rest of the problem. I know there'll be a stepwise. I'll get to that. I can just live in that place. And I can just, you know, as I said, use different parts of my brain when I'm drawing and different parts of my brain when I'm writing a little bit of text and let it unfold in front of me. And so that's about three or four answers, I think, as to why it works. When med students come and take your course, um, where are they in their training? Basically? They're in their last year. Their last year. So, so, and they select to take this. It's not. Yeah. It's not an. No, it's not, it's not, it's it's not, not a requirement. It's not required. It's. It's. Uh, Maybe it it's should be. You know. Um, so, what have you noticed about the self-selection of the group of people at the most intense, exhausted point of their medical training? They want to go be with the comics guy. Well, so this, this is interesting. The first time I caught, taught the course, I asked the students, why are you taking this course? Because they, they have to take a, an elective in humanities, but they've got a selection of 15 different things. Well, so the requirement is humanities, but the 
choice is comics. But the choice is comics, one of many. So I said, you know, why do you, why do you take this course instead of history or ethics or one of the others? And I had assumed wrongly that uh, there were people who read comics and were interested in graphic novels or they were artists or something. And I found many of the students took it because it fit into their schedule, right? <laughs> it was convenient. Well, um, I mean, if you had a choice to take, you know, European art history as your humanities elective or comics, I have a feeling comics might fit into your schedule a little bit more. <laughs> Maybe. Fourth year of med school. But that's, that's the first time I taught it. Now there's a reputation, and I've been teaching it, I've taught it four, five times now, and, and we hang up the completed works on a very prominent hallway at the medical school, and people are always there reading these comics, and there's a buzz around it, and so people know about the comics course, and the students I've had in the past couple of years, I've had someone say, boy, I've been waiting for three years to take this course. I've got ideas and uh, you know, I can't wait to do it. And you know, they're really, they, they want to have the opportunity to express themselves because there aren't that many opportunities in medical school to do it, at least creatively. You guys ever been to a Comic-Con? Never. I have in Chicago. Yeah, you should go. And I think you should aspire to there being like a whole area at the Comic-Con where instead of dressed up as like Green Lanterns, they're dressed up as nurses <laughs> and doctors. I think you're in that territory. I think you could definitely get there. Um, why does the Tangled story seem to only work in that medium? That you could not tell that story, and maybe it's a restatement of the original question, but in some ways, as a doc, if Pete Nix were involved in that story with his cameras, we would run away. The characters wouldn't tell the story properly. Um, we might end up being too horrified to retain anything from it. What is it about that medium and how she chose to do that that makes, that makes it the only possible way I could imagine that story being told? Right, right. I think there's something about uh, Sarah, the beauty and simplicity of Sarah's style that made that work. The use of stark black and white, um, the, the very strong use of uh, white space. There's a lot of white in that, um, and I think that's part of what makes it feel like something we can get through. Um, and that's, that's, I think, absolutely the answer is that she found the style that worked for that story. And can, can I add to that? Um, uh, Scott McCloud talks about, uh, he wrote a book called Understanding Comics, which is a very scholarly look at this. And one of the things he said is that what comics do is generalize. What a very, a, a photograph is about this specific person, a comic, because it's abstracted and it's, and it's more simplistic, it is about many, many more people because that person is a representation of, of all those folks who have Alzheimer's and are taking care of someone. And so there's more ability for people to relate to the characters than perhaps there would be if it was about a particular specific person. You know, I, I, I sort of buy that, but it seems like there's a lot more going on also. It, it, it's almost as though in medicine, and just let's think about all the situations you've described, it's the details that terrify us, but it's the emotional simplicity that we're drawn to. It, we, we think of the emotions as complex, but the the arrangement of things in the room as simple, but comics say it's actually the opposite. Mm. I, I just, is that your experience, that, that patients actually are able to handle complex emotions? It's sometimes the details of medicine that drive them screaming from the room. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, and you know, and I think comics are a strange combination of details and simplicity because you can have so much information done in a deceptively simple manner. It's, the drawings look simple, but there's a lot going on there. And I think it can communicate not only a story, but also emotions, complicated emotions, uh, as well as the details of sort of factually what's going on. And I think they're, they're, they look simpler than they are. There's a lot behind the scenes that, that make a comic work. The story that you told in the, uh, what was it, the Journal of Internal Medicine? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Annals of Internal Medicine. Annals of Internal Medicine that uh, disclosed your medical error. Yeah. Right. Had you ever publicly disclosed that story before in any other medium? Um, I had written a um, sort of brief story about it in a different format, it, but it had a very different uh, feel to it. And you didn't do the art? No. You just you did the, the panels. Yeah, I worked yeah. with the artists. We worked collaboratively on it. When you think about that uh, story and how difficult it must have been for you to tell and, 
at all bad. Are you being more candid in the comic medium, or are you hiding more behind the art in the story by disclosing it in that way? What do you think? More candid, less candid? More um, confessional, less confessional. I don't know. What I, you know, I don't. I think equally so. Yeah. I mean, it feels whether you tell the story by writing it in text or whether you draw it out. I think you feel raw by just telling the story and exposing yourself and admitting that you made a mistake and that you're fallible and human and uh, you know, and something bad happened. And uh, at least for me, it didn't feel more or less. Uh, it just it was just a different way of. of sort of exposing the story and, and telling, telling about it. Finally, in terms of transform in this conference and why, why we're all here, um, I think there's a lot of lip service paid to, we need to have more humanity in medicine, there needs to be less jargon, it would be better if artists were here, if people could get their constipated narratives out of themselves and, and find some sort of closure, and all that feels very reasonable but I'm wondering if over your long experience in working as both artists and practitioners in the field, if you could articulate a different, maybe bigger value of art in medicine that the people in this room could take away beyond, have you ever thought about drawing you know, a picture of what it is you're going through right now, which I think everyone in, in this room has that to take away. What is your sense, and both of you, the value of, of, of art here in this experience? I'll go first. Well, I think I, you know, I alluded to it in my answer before. I think that um, it, it's another access point. It, you, know, you, you talked about the windows. It's a different way in. Um, and if you find something that works for you, it's a way to um, do so many things. Like I said, for me, it's a way to manage my own stories and be able to be present to my patients. Um, as a patient education tool, it's a way to reach people that perhaps they're not able to be reached another way. I mean, we didn't talk very much about patient education comics, but it's a big part also of what we do. Um, so I think you captured it so perfectly in your introduction talking about windows, because that's, it, it's a window, it's a way in, it's an approach that is going to frame things differently as is the goal of this conference. Dr. Green? And as someone who teaches a lot, uh, medical students, residents, uh, faculty, um, I find that art is a way of helping people to be more astute observers of the world around them. It, f it helps people be better at seeing things. You, to make, either to look at art or to make art, you have to look very carefully and you pick up on details. And there have been, re there have been studies which have shown that observing art can make people better diagnosticians. Uh, and, and also, in my own course, we do surveys uh, before and after the course. We found that people feel more empathic toward patients after doing something like this because they have to get inside the shoes of somebody else. And if we're talking about transforming healthcare, part of it begins at the clinical encounter and being able to relate more to the patient, to see their stories, to understand what they're going through at a very basic level. And I think art can play an important uh, transformative role in doing and that. And particularly comic art just sort of breaks through all the noise and gets straight to the signal. All right, uh, you know the biggest box office movie over the weekend, either of you? Riddick? It, yeah. Hello? Marvel property? Yeah. Do you guys have agents? <laughs> what do you think? Marvel, The Orderly, huh? Not a bad idea. Hospice Planet, something like that? <laughs> something to I'm think loving about. it. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank, Thank you. you.